I am Jeff Barker and I represent House District 28, which is essentially from downtown Broadway, goes out to about 209th, it's kind of between Hart Road and TV Highway. That's the general, it wobbles a bit, but that's the, that's the general area. Uh, th this is my fourth term in the House, and uh, this year I'm chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and as uh, uh, Senator Bonamici mentioned before, it's a, those are very busy committees. I meet uh, constantly with uh, Lloyd Prozonsky, who's the chairman of the Senate Committee. We keep in touch because we have 600 bills now between the two of us, and there's still more coming in. And so we're trying to take those that have no chance of passage and not you know, moving them out of the way because we have so many to hear. Uh, I'm also on the Joint Ways and Means Public Safety Committee where we do the budget for all the public safety, the district attorneys, the prisons, and so on. Uh, several things have come up. Uh, we're hearing a lot of bills. Uh, one of the, the hot topics uh, coming up is whether or not concealed handgun license holders records are, are private or not. And there's a, you know, a decision out of Southern Oregon, so there's a bill that would, would keep them in public records, would make them not just open to anybody going in and getting them because there's people who believe that they should have the right to privacy on that, that they're, they're getting those permits for their own security or safety and they don't want everybody knowing it. And somebody said, well, I'd like to know if my neighbor has a concealed handgun license. They don't, you don't need to have a handgun license to own a gun, so you don't know if somebody has, has a gun or not. And so that really uh, wouldn't answer it. And a person could even have one and maybe sell his gun, not have a gun or her gun. So those are the kind of things we're looking at, but we're, we're trying to uh, have accommodation, get people in there and discussing what the issues are so we can come up with something that'll work. Another uh, big item this year is gonna be the, the, we call it Sour Law, the Statute of Ultimate Repose. And that has to do with when, when you uh, buy something and it breaks down, or especially if it causes injury, when is it still the manufacturer's responsibility? And at the present time, Oregon has an eight year limit on that. And so we've had people come in, there were some people from Lake Oswego, some teachers that were in a, in a gymnasium and a cover broke on a light and maybe you saw that a few years ago. Their eyes are damaged, they're still in severe pain and because they can't, don't know if those lights were made seven years and 11 months or eight years and one month, they're having trouble getting any kind of a settlement out of that. The, the lights weren't dated. There was a proposal this year to extend it, everything to 25 years. Well, some of the manufacturing people come in and say we, that's too much liability, we, we can't manufacture any of those. So we're looking at some compromises there as well to perhaps say uh, the manufacturer's liable for the or it's pre, disputable presumption for the first 10 years. The next 10 years would be up to the victim to show why it was the manufacturer's fault and then probably cap it at 20 years as part of the fairness. I mean, we spoke to people like the Greenbrier Group that builds the rail cars and so on, and, and they have a lot of concerns. I'm working on a bill that takes people who are in our prisons for nonviolent crimes that are here illegally, that have a ice hold on and waiting to deport them after they complete their sentences. I'm working on a, on a program where they could be deported today. We take them out of the prison, those prisons are very expensive, and these are nonviolent non felons. They go back to their home country. If they come back to the United States, they would be facing a two to 20 year sentence in the federal system. And we're gonna amend that so that if they come back to Oregon, they'll have to finish their Oregon term. So that uh, it might cynic, I hate to sound too cynical, but my hope is if they come back, they won't come back to Oregon if they come back into the United States. Uh, we've had some, uh, we're looking at measure 57, the, bill, the measure that was passed about pro property cr criminals. Because of these huge budget cuts, we're trying to see how we can best do that. We're, that program, if you recall, includes treatment. So we can help get these people turned around, get their thinking turned around. So we're working on getting the very best kind of programs we can possibly have to do that. But with the budget cuts, it's going to be tough finding room, we're, but we're working on that. I've been uh, meeting with Max Williams, who's the, uh, the director of the Department of Corrections, just trying to come up with some things. We've looked at some uh, drunk driving bills that we're trying, to, I'm trying very hard not to do anything that's gonna cost money. We're being very careful trying not to raise penalties at this time because we can't afford to send more people to prison except in the most egregious cases. Uh, the, one of the things the prisons are trying to do, they are asking to take their people out of the state training facility. They say they can claim they can save $7 million a biennium by training them themselves. 
And so I'm working, trying to work with the people at the training center, the Department of uh, Public Safety Standards and Training. John Minnis is the head of that. So that, to see if we can come up with something that'll work. So we, because we want those people, these prison guards trained really well for their safety as well as the prisoner safety. Uh, the Coffee Creek, the women's prison, is going to have to expand. They're getting more women prisoners than they used to. The, the meth thing has driven some of that property crimes, the, the identity theft, and right now they're trying to make a deal with uh, Multnomah County to lease uh, Wapato, which has been vacant for the last several years. If they can't do that successfully, they're going to have to close down their industries, one of their industries building on the prison site, and put bunks in there, and that would take away some of the jobs that people have that are in prison. They have great uh, children's programs there, some Head Start, early Head Start. One of the problems that they've seen over the years is Mom goes to prison, then daughter goes to prison. And now mom's in prison and granddaughter's being raised by grandma. And we're trying to break that cycle. And they have some great volunteer programs there where they, so that the mothers are learning how to be parents. They're taking uh, children's classes, how to raise their children, and hopefully get their spouses when they get out to, to help complete those programs. So we can kind of break that cycle and get people not in prison, get people thinking correctly that part of the... the thought process, if you're a thief, you go down the street. If you or I go down the street, we see a garage open, we think either nothing about it or the garage door is open. If you're a thief, you think, there's a lawnmower in there I can steal. The guy probably has insurance. What's the difference? It doesn't hurt anybody. And that's driving a lot of this kind of thing. And these people, once we, they get their cognitive thinking reset, hopefully, long run, we'll make Oregon a better place for all of us. Thank you.